So a class is nothing more or nothing less than a new variable. And we've seen in this, in this course the most basic variables only, like characters, which hold symbols. Um, we have floating points, we have floats and doubles for that. We have integers and we have booleans. And then we have arrays of those. So those are the variables we already know. Um, and we know that when we declare a variable, create it and initialize it, somewhere in memory, memory is reserved in the right appropriate way for those variables. Now we're going to extend this for any, any type of variable that we can make ourselves. And we're going to use classes for this. So a class is a set of variables that belong together. For instance, if you w uh, write a program, and in this program you need to have a, a person somehow modeled, then typically you have things like a name. We now know that the name is typically a string, which is in the lowest le uh, C level, an array of characters, right? So you have that, but then typically you have also other types of informa information for that person, like the date of birth or an ID number for this person, et cetera, et cetera. And those are also different variables that all belong together. And that make up a person. So in that case, you say that we create a class, which is called person, which is a collection of variables. But then also on top of that, those variables are typically only modified or, um, or, or something is done with those variables through a set of functions. And that is the, the second bullet point here. The set of related operations or uh, methods is then a set of functions, essentially, that are linked to this set of variables. So you have on the one side variables, and on the other side you have functions. Those are wrapped together into a class. Now, that is a class. A class is kind of a blueprint that basically says um, this, or a template, um, in how this type of data is structured, what type of variables really are under the hood when we say a person's name. This is typically uh, a character array with a, s a certain limited width, for instance. Or if we say the date of birth, and this is typically one integer for the days, one integer for the month, and one integer for the year, perhaps. So also the way that that is constructed is defined and declared into a class, as well as the operations that are on top of that. So if you have a person, you might need to create that person. So that is a, a method, a function. And this function that initializes all those variables to a, a certain settings is also something that belongs to this class. Now, an object is an instance of that class. So the class could be, for instance, person, and an object is one specific person that we create somewhere in memory. Something like you know, a person called Christoph, um, with the name Christoph, with this particular birth date, um, with this particular uh, set of uh, variables and functions that are, that are generic and that are coming from the class. So that would be one object, and that way you can, of course, create an array of objects or multiple objects, multiple persons, all of type uh, of the class person, but they have specific names or they have specific instances. So that would be an object, um, and it typically is called an object because it's related to something real, something that happens in the real world, like a person, a very specific person. We'll see several e examples of that uh, in the next couple of slides. <coughs> right. Now, the, the interesting thing about using objects and classes is that you want to hide the data that you're using inside a class, which seems a little bit silly. Up until now, when we created a number, we say this is an integer, and we call it my number, and we initialize it as 12. And a bit later, you can change this 12 to a 25 or some other value. But we've been very transparent about what type of variables we have. This is typically not what you do in object-oriented programming. In object-oriented programming, you have something that is called attributes. Those are our variables. And those variables have particular values, but we typically try to hide as much as, as possible of what these attributes are from the people who are going to use our class. And the people that are going to use our class are programmers, often ourselves, who are creating objects of this particular class. And we do this by hiding what these things are really and only making available to, uh, to the others that are using our class these functions. And these functions are the things that are going to change this data. 
We're not going to do this straight away. We can't say, I'm going to change the name from Carnegie into Johnson, or I'm going to change the department from 12 into 25, or I'm going to change the ID number and I'm going to just give this new number. That is not what you tend to do for object-oriented programming. You basically try to even hide the fact that there are certain variables like this. What people can see when they're using your class are these functions, which we call from now on methods, because they are methods that belong to this particular class. Here's how we're going to use later our class. So without showing you what the class looks like, um, this is going to be how we're going to use it. So we have a class, employee. This is something we already declared and programmed, and how that is done, I will, I will show you later. But we need then, whenever we have a class, to instantiate an object of that class. And typically we do this with a couple of parameters to already fill whatever is needed over here. So we have, for instance, our uh, specific object user of our class employee. And we're going to set the user to the name Carnegie, the ID number this over here, department 12, and the wage that this person is earning is uh, this particular number. All right, so that's, that is kind of now instantiated somewhere in memory. We have a user with those particular data um, that belong there. Um, once we have done that, the only thing we can do with this user is actually these four particular methods, these functions that belong to the class. So once we have, we have uh, created this user, we can move this user to a department, for instance. We can't just say the user's department should go from 12 to 27. We need to call this function, we need to call this method and say user.movedepartment17. One of the advantages there is that we have a lot more control as, our, as a programmer of what is going to happen here. Maybe in the company there are only 20 departments. If he would be able to, whoops, if he would be able to just change the department to any integer, then we could change the department to 65,000, which would be silly because there are no, probably not 65,000 departments. When we do this via this function over here, in this function, we can control this. We can say if the, de if the number that was supplied here is between 1 and 20, then it's valid. Otherwise, we return an error, for instance. And we're not going to change the department of this person. Right? So there's a lot more control in this way if you do this via the methods. That means once we've created this user who is in department 12 and we want to move this person to department 17, we have to do this through the method move to departments. And the advantage here is that we can check a lot more whether this makes sense in this case. Another thing that you will see is that we can change the name of the user, right? So this is also something that is possible. Um, we can increase the wage of this person, luckily, right? So that's also a possibility. And we can pr print a badge. What we can do is, for instance, ever, once this person is created, change the ID number because there's no methods that you know, allows us to change the identity number of this person. This is also built in and it makes sense for such an application. Right? So we want to make sure that once we've created this person, this person has given an, a unique ID typically, and this identification stays and it can never be changed anymore unless we remove this person altogether. Right? So that is the nice thing about this encapsulation. Encapsulation allows you as a programmer to say we have these type of attributes, but we're going to only allow uh, a few peaks outside. And when people want to use our class, like we do it over here, they only have a couple of um, functions or methods available to them that kind of make sense to the application. For this application, it would not make sense that you would be able to change this user ID, for instance, so you can't. There is an integer here that could be changed, but it can't, it can't be changed because there's no uh, method available. Right? So that's how you control as a programmer what happens to the data inside your object, which is an instantiation of the class. And th th there's two advantages here. So the, the, the one thing is data protection, for instance, that we, we allow people not to change anymore the ID once this person has been created. 
And once this person is created, I mean, in the example here, we gave the ID ourselves, but you can, of course, create this automatically. So that this uh, identification number is something that is unique. Um, so our attributes are private. We can't change them anymore. So you can't go over here and say user.id number equals 12. Well, that is not possible. Or user.department equals 17. Also, that is not possible. You can't get access to that data. The only thing you can do is uh, use the method move to department 17, for instance, or change name and then change the actual name of the user. All right? So that is one thing. The other thing is information hiding, which is also quite important. The way you implement those attributes, for instance, or the way you implement those functions, those methods that belong to those attributes, is all up to you as a programmer. Typically, the people who are going to use this new type of variable, which is called, in this case, perhaps, uh, it's called employee, right? Um, the, the way they are going to use this is very clear. They can only use those four methods, and that's it. How you're implementing then the wage, whether this is a float or a double, should not concern them. The only thing that concerns them is how much they can increase the wage by, and that's it. Right? So in that case, you can perhaps also um, uh, have, a, have a float here, but you can, for instance, implement the wage as a double, as an example. But those are kind of finicky, under the hood details that no one should care about, especially not the people who are going to then create um, instantiations of your class, like a particular employee called Carnegie, for instance. In that case, they should just be able to create one and then through those methods that are available, deal with the data. And that is the nice thing. It's a nice level of abstraction um, through this uh, data protection and through this information hiding. <coughs> Here's another example, um, or a more concrete example. So typically when you create a class, you look at the data-centric points. And as I already said, we have been looking at very limited type of examples up until now, where we just use a character or an array of integers um, or, or a set of functions that operate on those. Well, in this case, we have a concept, for instance, um, a GPS coordinates in your program. So in that case, you abstract this into a class. You say there is such a thing as a GPS coordinate, and from now on, this is a variable that people can create and initialize, just like we've been creating a Boolean to true, for instance, or we've been creating an integer and we've set it to zero. So the, exactly the same is now possible to a GPS coordinate. So we created somehow, and again, that I'm going to reveal later, a class called GPS coordinate. So that is the class name. And we instantiate, we make a one specific GPS coordinate, which we call here. And that is our object. So know that is exactly the si same type of notation as we've created, for instance, a character, right? We have a character, we call this symbol, and then we could also Im initialize this to something, a question mark, for instance. So in this case, we create a GPS coordinate and we call this here. That's exactly the same. And then we know from the documentation of the class that we have a couple of uh, methods available, functions that belong to our uh, object here. And we have then the get latitude, the get longitude, set and set elevation. We don't really know anything about these attributes over here. We typically, as a user of our object here, know that just these four methods are available. So we can set the longitude and the latitude together. That makes sense. You know, why would you just set the longitude and then just set the latitude? Typically, when you want a coordinate somewhere on Earth, you're mostly interested in the latitude and the longitude. So that's where what we're doing right over here. We basically say there is an object, and we're now going to set the location of this object to 50 dot something, comma, 8 dot something. This is the actual coordinates of right here where we are now. Right, so this, this is basically a way of saying we have an object which is a GPS coordinate and we set the latitude and longitude, longitude to a particular value. We also can set the elevation. You could do this automatically perhaps. So perhaps if you would do this in a very nifty way as a programmer, you could perhaps have a lookup table that says for anywhere on Earth, 
that you have the ground level already pre-programmed uh, so that we are here at 285 meters, for instance. I think we are higher. But anyway, um, so you could change this and say, okay, the elevation we could change still to a couple of meters higher. So if you, for instance, want to create a program inside a drone, then this would be how you uh, create a GPS coordinates. And you could set the elevation then to something higher than ground level uh, through the set elevation methods. So also that would make a lot of, uh, a lot of sense. What you can also then get uh, afterwards is the latitude and the longitude of a particular GPS coordinate. But what we don't allow here as a programmer, for instance, is to get the elevation afterwards. We have a GPS coordinate. We set the, uh, the Cartesian coordinates, so the longitude and longitude of that. We could also set the elevation, but afterwards we don't allow the user to get the elevation anymore. I'm not sure why in this case, but for such an application, or there could be an application where this is necessary. So in this case, this is an advantage. The user can only enter the coordinates and can uh, later just get the XY coordinates, basically, of that GPS coordinate, but that's it. And that is how you then, for instance, use such a GPS coordinate. You have an object of this particular class, and what you do with the object is you invoke or you call then the methods that belong to that object. And that way you can do things just as we've done things up until now through functions. Now we're going to see how finally how such a class is defined. And that is a little bit different and a little bit, uh, a lot of new things. So when you say I want a new class which belong or which has these particular attributes, so these particular variables that belong together and these particular functions, you're just listing them one after the other. And the way to do this is by using a new keyword to use class and then the name of that class. So over here we say we basically now define and declare a new class with the name GPS court, which is short for GPS coordinates. The curly braces that follow there are nothing compared to like, for instance, how you define and declare um, and implement a function. Right, so in that case, after the curly braces, you had loads of statements that are executed one after the other. This is not anything like that. In these curly braces, we basically have a list of all the attributes and functions of that, uh, of that class, but the, 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 the sequence does not matter that much. What matters is that you always declare whether those things are private or public, and typically, all the data, so all the variables, and what we're calling now the, all the attributes of that class, are typically always private. That means they can be changed outside the class, and they can be accessed outside the class. And then public is typically all the functionality that you, uh, uh, that you link to these data. So we have in this case three doubles, the latitude, the longitude, and the elevation, and those three doubles make up the data of a GPS coordinate. However, this is, as I said already, completely hidden. So this is private, and that means that no one will, that uses our class, that creates an object of our class, will be able to access these three variables. These are only accessed through the functionality. Then public functions, so from now on, everything that follows public is now public, um, and there are four methods as we've already seen. We have the set methods, we have the set elevation methods, the get latitude method, and the get longitude methods. Those are the four functions, and we are basically declaring them as functions as we've seen already. You know, they have a return type, and if they don't, then we just say they are void, and then they might have some parameters or not, right? So get latitude is just returning the latitude of that function, uh, of that object. Same for the longitude. For set elevation, we only have one parameter, namely the elevation that we want to set this object to. And for set, the set method, we have two parameters. The first one is the latitude, the second one is the longitude that we're going to set for this GPS coordinate. All right, so that is how we're going to now say this is the way our class is structured. And with that, G C++, when it parses this, knows, okay, from now on, we have a new variable which is of a class GPS cores, and it is constructed exactly like this. The only thing that we now still need to do is define those functions. We need to show C++ 
how those functions are implemented. But that is kind of how you say to C++, this is how this class is declared. And when we now define those functions, we basically have to do this at a later stage and say, we have a function set which belongs to the class GPS coordinate. That's why we have this particular notation. The same for set elevation, get elevation, and get latitude. So before this function name, when we declare and now implement our functions, we need to also specify what class they belong to. If we forget this over here, G plus, C++ plus will be completely confused and will say, there is this new function, get latitude. I have no, I, I'm going to define this as a new normal function, not as a function, as a method that belongs to the class GPS coordinates. So with this over here in front of the name, so the GPS coordinates, uh, GPS chords, colon, colon, and then get latitude, we now define that this get latitude is a method that belongs to the class GPS coordinates. And the same for the other functions. Right, and this makes sense because this is how we declared it here. If we would forget any of those over here, we would uh, get an error later from C++ or the compiler who says, you promised that you would implement the get latitudes, but you're not doing this anywhere. Yes, a question. Yeah, you can do that. So that's something that we'll see in a few slides. That is just a small implementation detail. You could do all of this over here, right over here as well. This is typically how it's done in Java, for instance, right? However, it is nicer. Up until now, we've seen modules, right? Where we basically say we have a specific file, which is defined into a header file and a CPP file. In the header file is basically everything that we promised to implement, and in the CPP file we actually implement it. That is one of the nice things in C++. You just have to look at the header files and then you know everything that needs to be known, how to use a particular function or now also a particular class. If we would do this, then we would have everything into one file, and this one class definition would get gigantic. I'm not sure how many of you know Java, um, or other languages do this too, where everything is uh, immediately also implemented in the class. That typically gets very um, chaotic very quickly. This way we can shortly say, this is what is really mattering for that class, and how these functions are implemented, how these methods uh, in, the, in the, the second half are implemented, we'll put that in the CPP file. C++ can afterwards parse this, can, can link those, but for the people who are going to use our class, this is what really matters, and not how we implemented those four functions, right, those four methods. But so it's a very good question. Right, so this is what we do now. So from now on, when we create a program, we're going to create classes, and we first say, this is how, what our class looks like, what data is there, the, th the three doubles over here, and also how this class is being used, what, for, what methods we make available to the people that are going to use our class. So this is kind of like the, the higher level planning. Once you've done this, you have to go and actually implement those methods that you promised to implement. Here they're very small, but typically they get larger and larger for classes. Right? And those, we'll see later also, we put into separate files. So it's a little bit nicer to deal with, uh, with the code as well. Now, what happens when we do create such uh, an object of our class? So now we know how GPS core to the class is created. <coughs> we know that, G that C++ knows now that there are these three doubles that belong to the class and those four methods that belong to the class essentially functions that can be called inside uh, or with that class. And they're implemented like this. So when we have this example here, <coughs> what we have is as soon as we create the object here of, ta of class GPS coordinates, somewhere in our memory, memory is being reserved for exactly this new variable here, which is an object. So here is known now to exist and since this is uh, an object of class GPS chords, which we know, we know now that this belongs out of four doubles over here. 
So in the memory, we already reserve four doubles. Um, even though we did not even set those to a particular uh, value. So initially, when we d define and declare the, func the class as we have in the previous two slides, then those will likely be zero, or actually a random number of what was there before into the memory. What also is stored into memory is that there is a set of methods that belong to this data as well. And that's it. Uh, what is also stored that is not shown here is that here is basically a GPS court object. It belongs to this particular class. Yes? Uh, if you have like private methods, it would be only accessible by the public entity. If we have private methods, that means if we have, um, if we would, for instance, say we move this public over here, then set would be a private method, and you would not be able to call sets for that object. It would only be able to be called from other uh, functions within that class. Is that uh, the answer? Okay, I'll show this in a second again because that's also a very important concept. What can we call where, right? That is, um, that is something that you just have to get used to by, by doing it. So once we have here our part of our program, this could be part of the, the main function or part of another function, we create our new variable, which is an object called here. We know that this is of a GPS coordinate, and then we put this, uh, this is automatically put into memory by C++, the compiler. Now when we launch then a method, we call a method in that case, then we know that these values are in that case changed. So we change our latitude and longitude to these two numbers, we change our elevation to those numbers, and then we can get our latitude and longitude and put those into different types of variables, just as we've done up until now. The only difference is that we created now a new variable, essentially, which, uh, we, for which we use the class keyword. Okay? Now, to come back to your question, when can, where can we see what? Now, within one of those methods, so when we create or when we um, implement the functions, the methods that belong to GPS coordinates. So we have only four. We have set, set elevation, get latitude, and get longitude. So within the implementation of those functions, we can see everything of the class. Even though they are private, you know, those lat, long, and elf um, uh, variables, we can actually get them. And that's how the set function works, right? So we basically say that lat, which is this variable over here, the attribute that is private, we can set this to the value of la, which is basically uh, the parameter of the method that we just have, right? So when set is called with a particular number and the latitude is 50, for instance, over here, then lat gets the value 50, right? Just like that. The same for the longitude. Longitude is this private attribute, this double that belongs, that is inside the class. Normally, from outside the class, we can't change this. But from within one of those uh, functions, we can. And therefore, we can basically set the long to the, the parameter LO. So when we call this method set with 50 and 8 as numbers, then we move this, this, this value 50 and 8 into lat and long respectively, right? That's how we've known functions to work. We basically, through the parameters, can copy the values over here, the values 50 and 8, and those are being copied then inside our attributes. So private does not matter if you are a member function or a method of the class itself. So for those four functions, set, set elevation, get latitude, and get longitudes, those three uh, doubles over here can be accessed. We can set them and we can get their values, just as normal variables. So that is a possibility. So what we can do then is basically we can call the, the, the set uh, methods of the class, we can provide these two values, and they will be copied into our internal attributes that we normally don't see. What you can do is, once we have our object here over here, we can't get uh, access to lat, long, or elf in this case and change those. So that would be impossible, right? 
The same for if we would have a function over here that would be private, like we would have private, three private variables, we could also have a private function. In that case, you, if set were to be private, then you would not be able to uh, call set from here. You would only be able to call set from inside a method of the class itself. Okay? That is quite important, and it requires a little bit of routine to, to, to get to know this. Now, as you can see over here, whenever we launch a function, it's not part of this object that we created here. We have an object here which has particular data. We know that it's, there, there are links to particular functions, but those functions are not, not really reserved into memory. They're only active in memory when those functions are called. Then, you know, they're basically linked, and we basically see that we have these two parameters of our function, of our methods, and we basically have access to those three from within our function. That's why I put those next to each other, but this function is not staying alive, right? So I've, as soon as we call the function, we, uh, we execute all the statements that are here, and as soon as we leave the function, this blue block in our memory is gone again. But what happened afterwards is, of course, that those lat and long values have been changed. Okay? That's, that's an, an important uh, thing to get. <coughs> as, we know, as you know by now already, we're very adamant about indentation. Um, and also here we have a new type of rule that we then introduce for uh, when you do uh, implement and declare a class that you only have one space in front of the private and public keywords and two spaces when you then define the variables and the methods or the, the, the data members and the data functions that belong to that class. So from now on, make sure that you adhere to this particular indentation because from today on there will be new exercises and also there indentation is one of the things we're going to mark on. Right? So that make sure that you uh, you know this. What is space over one tab? Uh, there is no such thing as tabs in a, in a nano editor. That's what we do, uh, what we give to you as a service because it's a space basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, this is uh, adhering to the CPP lint, so Google's style of, uh, of CPP programming. Um, and it makes sense. It is basically a very minimalist way, so you don't have to type too much. You know, basically, if you type space and then privates, uh, then you have to, then you go to the next and you type one more space to then uh, type whatever happens to the variables and what happens to the, to the uh, methods that you declare for that class. Okay? Another two important things that typically get forgotten, this new, this new keywords, private and public, need to be followed by a colon. And this is of course, I mean, if you then are used to Python, for instance, it's also a little bit um, confusing um, to get that because this is not very, very much like C++, but it's important to know this. So as soon as you want to declare attributes, typically you always have private colon in front of that, and everything that follows from then on is private. Until you get one of the new keywords, or until you get public, and once you have public, you basically have everything that follows public is then public. Um, so all of these are not uh, accessible by the objects and those once the object is created, those are accessible once the object is created. Another thing that is typically also forgotten is the semicolon at the end. That is just a, a definition matter. When you define a class, these curly braces are nothing like a function implementation. Um, they're basically a list of the, the variables and functions that belong to this class. And this, uh, the semicolon at the end kind of also reflects this. Right? So make sure that you kind of get used to this. Once you create a class, it needs to end with a semicolon, and you need to define private and public with a colon. And then everything that follows those keywords is then private or public. And of course you can change this. A bit later you can also here go for private again. Um, you can change the sequence of that as you wish. Right? It's nothing like a function definition and implementation where you basically have uh, statements following one after the other. Uh, so these are completely different concepts. Okay, so that is how we do this. Another minor note is that we, of course, we could have uh, put public attributes, uh, or we could have private functions, as you said earlier. 
But typically, this is not what people do. When we are, when we are doing object-oriented programming, then typically all the attributes we have are private, and all the methods we have are public. But there might be some border case where this does make sense, um, where you would have an attribute that where it's just easier to make it public so that people, whenever they create an object of class test in that case, like over here, we have created an object my test, that's the name of class test, and then we can actually access attribute two and set it to false. In this case, we don't have any encapsulation for our attributes. We basically say attribute two can be changed at any time by anyone, right? So in that case, we say my test dot attribute two that is this attribute right over here, can be set or can also be read as people wish. So there, there is no data protection uh, happening. But sometimes that does make sense. Um, and the same can also be done for methods. We can also say that, for instance, here we could Im implement private again, for this line, and method two would not be able to be called over here because it's a private method. Why would you have a private method? Perhaps because it's kind of a helper function, a helper method that is, for instance, used within method one or within another method that is open. That could be one um, reason to use such a helper method, right? So that is, that is kind of a, 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 I would say try not to do this. Whenever we are declaring a class, make sure that the attributes are all private and that most of the member methods, the, the, the functions that belong to that class, are public so that people can use the, the functions. That is the general case how people tend to do to what use this. Uh, people sometimes you define a password for your system mm -hmm. to the class and you want to let everybody access it for everybody. True, so you, you're not uh, allowing them to read it, but again that is that something that you cr uh, create a method for. That you basically just say a set password where you can set the password new, but you, there's no get password uh, method in that case. That's how you then protect that password. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't really well. There, there's there's better ways to do that, but you know it's a good example. I think um, how you try to how uh, through methods through the functions that belong to the class you can s set what people can do. You know the, you can change the password sure, but you can't just get the password as real text, for instance. Yeah, you can check the password, for instance. You can basically then have another method that says check or enter the password and then it says or it checks whether those passwords that you provided is the same as the password for the class and which then returns a Boolean, for instance. Also, that would be a possibility. But what definitely would not make sense if, you, if we would have a get method where you say get the password and it basically just uh, prints out the password. That would be silly. Any more questions? Yes. You can make it public, but uh, the value that can be constant is just read it and it can be stored. Um, what if you do this to attribute two, then you can uh, change the attribute two, and you can also read the attribute yeah. two. It comes at, uh, it's just like in any, any other variable. Instead of just having a method for check that we will read. Yes. I mean, uh, that, is, that is a very good question. Why do we need to, I mean, if we want for attribute one, then do, to do the same. And attribute one needs to be able to be changed and we need to get the value. Why do we then have to create a method called set attribute one and get attribute one? This is typical in object-oriented programming. We call those setters and getters, right? Why would you need to do that? The answer is because the functionality then still allows later for us to do a lot of checking, for instance. Maybe this attribute one is a value between zero and 100, and the way we implement this at first, we don't check this. But then later, when we get the newest version of our class, we can suddenly change this. In that case, the way the people our use our class is still the same. It's just this get and set methods have been changed because they have this check now, suddenly. Right? So it is a little bit nicer and a little bit more sustainable programming if you use set and get methods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and then it makes sense to have a private attribute there, where you, where you basically just get the information, but you're not able to set it anymore, for instance. 
and that you can do through making it private and only allowing member methods to, uh, to set or change things there. Yeah, I mean, but, but, but that's the point. I think it's, 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 that's the paradigm. You try to not make too many uh, attributes public. Try to always set them to private. Um, and then, you, of course, you have a little bit more work in then defining those methods that belong and that set and get the values. But it comes with the additional uh, advantage that later those, those functions can be enriched with extra checks or with other things that happen where you kind of can, can check how many times an attribute was changed, for instance, or many other things. So it's kind of a layer in between, a safety buffer, um, and it does make sense for many cases. Yes, uh, within, like, like we do it over here, right? So that is the, the note that I wanted to say here still, as uh, you earlier said, we can implement these functions straight away in the class. Here we can do this because there's only one um, statement over here. And over here there's just one little bit of an output thing going on. However, as you start programming these things, and you will see this in your assignments later, um, these things tend to get longer and longer and longer. In that case, this nice few lines in how we can kind of tell C++ this is what it means to have a test class will get really long and chaotic. You want to kind of separate this. You want to say the, the test class has these uh, two methods and these two attributes. This attribute is private, this attribute is public, those two methods are also public. That's all we need to know really as users of this class. And then the implementation of all those methods happens somewhere else. That is typically also cleaner. But I mean, again, again, it's a style thing. You know, it would not violate C++ to have here 200 statements uh, following within those curly braces. It would make this thing a little bit unreadable, but it would still be valid C++ code. Right, and then just to wrap it up, um, this is how you typically then create a class for yourself in your project. <coughs> You have usually in the header file the declaration of the class. So you say, I have now a new class with this particular name, with these attributes and these methods over here. Um, and that's what all you need to know. Right? That is nice, that is clean. And whenever people want to use your class, they just have to look at the header file. Hopefully you would also have quite a bit of documentation there where you see a little bit more about what you intended, but that's about it. How you implement those methods over here is typically secondary. It's not that important. People should then, from a, from a little bit of a, of a description here, know what those functions do, right? So in that case, for each of the functions that belong to the test class, again, make sure that you, you tell C++ that they belong to the test class, you basically define those functions as we know we defined the functions before. You have a return type or void, you have the name of the function, and then you have the, uh, the parameters that belong to that function. And then to b between the curly braces, you can say then what type of, um, uh, of statements the function belongs, or what, what type of statements the function yeah, has, basically. And then those two together are very similar to what we had already as a module. Up until now, our module was just a sequence of functions typically, that we that belong together. Like in our maze game, we had then, for instance, drawing functions for drawing the entire maze, or drawing the, the user inside this maze and moving around. So that would be uh, encapsulated into this test.h and test.cpp. Typically, the name of the file is exactly the same as the name of the class. And typically in C++, the name of a class always starts with a capital. That's also just a convention. It's not really absolutely necessary, but that's how it works. And then when we want to use our class, typically this is in our own program, so we have somewhere a main function. We can, in that case, create an object myTest of class test, and then we can use this myTest as we have defined it over here. So we know now that we can just uh, set the attribute 2 to false, or true, or we get uh, attribute 2. 
by saying my test dot attribute two equals false. This dot operator is basically saying for my object, my test, we now access attribute two. And since there are no braces here, we know that this is an attribute and not a method. If we have braces here, like over here, for instance, we know that this is a method, right? So we say my test dot method one is basically we call now the function method one, the method method one, with this particular um, parameter, 21, right? And then we know if, if, if this is kind of making sense that uh, method one probably was then, or should have been called set uh, attribute one, then we know that attribute one now has the value 21. Okay, so that's what, um, what is the most important part here. So that is how we typically from now on start programming classes. Rather than in our main file just uh, de de declaring uh, variables and then declaring before the main file or main function uh, particular functions that operate on those variables. No, from now on those functions belong to a class and they're called methods. And the class has then one or multiple attributes that define the data that we're working with. And that is all encapsulated into one class. Okay? That is part one of what I wanted to uh, say. Part two, which is equally important for today, is knowing what constructors and, de and destructors are. Once you create a variable in C++, we already know that. We have, we have to say what type this variable is, what the name of the variable is, and then we can immediately initialize this variable. And this initialization we don't really know yet for classes, right? So we, we basically create a class, but then we usually have to still fill in those attributes through member functions. That's what's how, we, how we've done it for the GPS coordinates. We then call them the set methods to then set the, la the latitude and the longitude. Now we can do this in one go. We could say we create an object my location of the class GPS coordinates, and then between the braces, we then say, and this location is, this is the latitude, this is the longitude, and this is the elevation. And those are the coordinates of the city of Zigi. So that is the same as what we have over here. We create a new, we have a new variable of the class GPS coordinate, which we call an object. And this object we immediately set to particular values. Um, and you don't have to set in all the attributes usually. Typically this initialization uh, does not always have to do this explicitly either. Um, but there is a way then to say as soon as you create an object, <coughs> we initialize the attributes of that object straight to particular values. Sometimes they can be supplied. So these are three we now supply to the, to the object. Sometimes they can be internally. So when we basically say uh, my location without the braces, then internally we could set them to zero, for instance. <coughs> Right, here's another example for the employee class that we've seen. So in this case, we create an object called user of class employee, and we immediately then say this user is called Carnegie, has the uh, ID uh, 62,000 and a bit, um, is part of department 12, and this is the monthly wage of this particular user. Um, or we can have something else. We basically have um, another class which we call sized symbol, where we, for instance, say, a symbol needs to be sizable of a certain uh, um, width and height. So in this case, we just need to not only provide the symbol that we want to hold in this object, but also the size of the symbol. So in this case, we call this big question because it's a question mark. But then also part of this uh, object's information is how big the symbol should be, namely 14. Right? So and this is then a, another object belonging to the class size, uh, size symbol, which we need and immediately initialize as a question mark with a particular size. Okay, so those are three examples how we create an object and immediately initialize what, what is supposed to happen in these objects. And the thing is, how do we implement this? There is no such thing so far that we know of how we need immediately initialize those attributes. Up until now, we had to define an extra method like set um, uh, to, to fill in that information into the attributes. But luckily, there is a way 
which is called a constructor, to do this straight away, and sometimes even automatically. The first thing you need to know about a constructor is a constructor is actually just like a method. However, it is called automatically. You don't have to explicitly call it, like you had to call set or get latitude. Now, in that case, whenever you initialize my location like this with those braces, automatically this constructor is called. So here we have our uh, test example again. And we have one attribute, and we have um, uh, publicly two methods. Now, this method over here is a very special one. You can probably already see this, because the name of this method is exactly the name of the class. It's, it's a function, but it has basically a specific name. And another special thing is that it does not have any return type, not even voids. So that it makes it very, very special. But essentially, it is just a method, because the rest looks very similar to a function. Right? It has a parameter, and it has then between the curly braces whatever happens when this particular constructor, because that was, uh, this method is called, is called. So this is an example of a constructor. So the constructor in this case has parameters, just like a function has. It has a name, just like a function has, but this name has to be the same as the class name. And another special thing is it does not have any return type at all, not even void. Now, whenever you can create a uh, an object of this class, so whenever you create my test in this case, and you then supply then this 21 over here, what is automatically happening then is that this function over here is called, this constructor is called, and then this 21... Sorry, what is my test? Sorry? What is my test? My test is over here. No, where is the, oh, yeah, yeah. And it is uh, an object of the class test. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could have call, called this anything. You know, we could all also call this tests with a small t or a t. We could have called this t. Right? This is just a name we give to the object that we're now creating in memory. Okay. So my test over here is, not, is being created. That's what we already saw. In memory, somewhere now, there is this red blob. Um, with one integer attribute and then with uh, those two methods. However, this method over here, which is called a constructor, is automatically called. We don't have to say my test dot tests, um, then bra uh, braces open, 21 braces closed. No, as soon as you have my test and between the braces 21, this over here is called. That means 21 is our parameter. So basically 21 is then assigned to attribute 1 over here. And this is also why people use constructors, to automatically give default values to the attributes that are part of the class. Yes? Um, can you have more than one constructor in your class? Very good question. Yes, you can. Um, another thing is that you don't always need constructors. But if you don't implement constructors, like we have done in the previous couple of slides, C++ will create an, a constructor for us, and it will still exist. It will be empty, there are no statements in there, but the default constructor, which is the one without any parameter, will always exist. But then, if, <coughs> if we have more than one constructor, how would we make it? Would they all be A very good uh, follow-up question. It is basically what we saw already with functions. If you have one function with a particular name, and another function with exactly the same name, then it's the different type of parameters that are supplied that make the difference. So C++ will know that in this case, it will need to call the constructor with one parameter because we only give one parameter. If we had another uh, constructor here with two parameters, or with five parameters, or with zero parameters, then it would know it would not be one of those, but we'd, we would only supply this one parameter over here. It will get a little bit more complicated once we see a couple of bells and whistles that you can add, but that is the essence here. That is essentially what is happening. So a constructor is nothing more than a special method that automatically gets called when you create an object of the class. And then you win because of these braces over here, you know which constructor to call or which parameters that are then sent to the constructor, which then the constructor can use to then, for instance, uh, set the value of attribute 1 
to this parameter, which is in this case 21. All right? And of course, we can call method 2 as before, because that's also a public method, as we've already seen. And this will then print out 21, yeah, because it prints out attribute 1, basically, to the terminal. OK? That was basically the answer to your question. You can have multiple constructors. So in this case, we have one constructor with one parameter, and we have one constructor with two parameters. Um, they do more or less the same, or no, they do something slightly different, because here in this case we have two attributes. But in this case, if we then call, uh, or if we create a new object, my test of class test, and we supply here two parameters, then C++ knows automatically, OK, I need to call this particular uh, constructor, not this one, because I have two parameters, two integers in this case. And of course, the type of parameter also shows you. If you would have one, uh, one constructor with an integer and another constructor with a double, for instance, and you would supply here a double constant, like 4.0, for instance, then it would be no which constructor to call here, namely the one where the one parameter is a double and not where the other parameter is uh, an integer. That, however, makes things a little bit harder for the user because sometimes you can, of course, uh, supply a four and you mean a double in this case, but it is not used. So also there, typically people try to not create too many constructors because the, way, the more constructors you have, the more uh, possibilities that people will get a little bit confused by those constructors. Also, the more you have to program, which typically is also not always a good thing. Yes? Uh, what if I, I want to create two constructors, which is the same number of parameters, but perhaps the same number of function types? Oh, then that is impossible. So, so basically, if you would have one constructor with an integer and another constructor also with an integer, then C++ would go berserk. They would say, you promised, or you can't do this, basically. Um, because then afterwards, if you then, for instance, would have here, say you had, would have two constructors with two integers as parameters, then C++ would never know which constructor to call over here. Yeah, it would not be possible. So that is impossible as well. Yeah. OK, that's, again, uh, we're getting towards uh, a little bit more um, fringe cases. Typically, you have one or two constructors, and that's it. And often, you have one default constructor, which does not have any parameters at all. Also, that is a possibility. <coughs> and that's basically what is uh, over here said. So if you have a default constructor, that is the constructor without any parameters, and of course, you can implement this. However, if you don't uh, implement this at all, in this case, C++ will still make it for you. But what will happen then is that this over here, so we have our class test, so we have our constructor test over here, no return value, no void. So that is a constructor with no parameters. So that is our default constructor, and it's empty. So basically, there are no statements that are being executed here. Now, that is our default constructor. And this default constructor will still work. That means you could still have here, between my tests, the braces open and closed, so no constructors, and it would still then do nothing, basically. So C++ kind of fills in that gap. There is always a default constructor, even if you don't supply it in your class. All right? Um, and a constructor is always invoked. Always a, a constructor will be called. So even if you do this over here, where you don't have the braces, you still then call the default constructor. And that is also kind of reversible. If we would implement a default constructor and we would set the attribute 1 to 0 over here in the implementation of that constructor, then that would exactly happen here as well. Even though we don't have braces, it does not show that we are doing something, but this initialization still takes place. Right? So our attribute 1 still would get set to 0 if we would have implemented our default constructor and we would have this, this statement over here. All right? Now, just like we have a constructor, we also have destructors. And destructors are quite important because 
Well, I can't say it yet. That for that, we have to then see a little bit further into pointers and references. But there are cases where you want to make sure that you do a couple of things before your object is destroyed. And again there, think of the memory model that we're constantly using. Whenever you create my test over here as an object and you initialize then the attribute to 17 over here, then this object is somewhere in memory. As soon as we leave this function over here, this object is destroyed from memory. And this does not have to be the main function, it could also be some other function that we are using. Right? So in this case, we created an uh, object my test of class tests. We set uh, to certain values. We could also call a couple of methods that belong to my test. But as soon as we get out of a function where this object was created, this object is gone. Just like an integer would be gone or a character would be gone that you would define in a particular function. What we have, however, is then a specific function called a destructor, which automatically gets called when this um, uh, object over here is destroyed, when it's removed from memory. Sorry, somebody had a, a, a question. Yes, yes. So basically, um, so that's basically what I said here. My test is an object over here. If I would have removed those two uh, commenting uh, uh, quotes, and I would have implemented this default constructor, like it is here, test and a no parameter. And then between the curly braces, I would have said attribute one equals zero, or attribute one equals 100. Then over here, my attribute one would be zero or would be 100. Because the default constructor is an always called. And if I implement this default constructor and I do something in that constructor, then it's, this is called and this is used. Yeah. But you don't call anything in the package. Exactly. We don't have to use braces here. So in this case, the default constructor is still called. Um, I mean the implementation of the default constructor. You don't call anything in the package. Here, these braces, no. There is no parameter in that case. If there's no parameter, that's the default constructor. And then basically, it's exactly like this. You create my test as an object, but then still, that is being called. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the method declaration, do we need to have a semicolon? At the end of the method, do you need to have a semicolon? No, actually not. This is superfluous. Uh, oh, uh, sorry. Um, this is, uh, I mean, I also don't have it here because there's no statement, of course. But no, you don't need to, exactly. I don't know why I did it here, actually. Um, probably, oh, actually, I'm not entirely sure. Oh, this is homework for me. I don't know, actually, whether the semicolon here is necessary or not. I'll know it by uh, next time. <laughs> Sorry, it's, all the, it's, it's there for all of them, right? The problem is it could be there for all of them because I basically just implemented here between the curly braces yeah, but it makes sense actually that they're here. Uh, I, would say it, I would say it is necessary, but we can try it out uh, in a second. We're going to program soon a little bit still. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. I mean, there must be a reason why I put them there, but then there's, there was also a reason why I didn't put them here. Because so it might be, it might be, it might be a, a, an, an error on my side. We'll see. But we're going to check this out in a second. <coughs> so this is, this is then what happens to, um, when a, a, an object is removed from memory, the destructor is automatically called, and the destructor is exactly like the constructor, except that it's, uh, uh, it, it uses a tilde in front of it. So it has exactly the same name as the class, but a tilde in front of it, and the rest is exactly the same. Up until now, we will see only uh, destructors that are the default ones, as you, as you would expect a default <laughs> constructor to work. Okay? So that is, I think, where I want it to be, yes. So now we're going to have a little bit more time for a very simplistic example. So I'm, I will actually give a couple of more examples. Um, so this is an example that you should do at home, just to try out to see whether you, you, you have it internalized, what a class means. Um, and we're going to do this one right now because this is a very simple one. And then later, 
what I would like to do is, or uh, what I would like to do is also extend our maze game with, in this case, now a class rather than a module. Also, that has repercussions. But that we can do perhaps at uh, the beginning of next time. All right, time to finally program. I mean, today was a very theoretical part. I hope you can see this. So this is exactly the same program that we already had as example one that we just saw. The idea is now that we write a class where the uh, constructor and, ex and the destructor are automatically writing something um, in the terminal. How do we define a class? With the class keywords. How do we, or what type of class should we implement? I'm not entirely sure. Use the class with no attributes. I think we can choose what the name of the class is. We call it just my class, for instance. That's a very unimaginative but um, successful formula. As I said, always semicolon after the class definition. So now we're going to define what is in our class. Um, we know now that our class is no attributes. So there is no reason now to start uh, typing private as you normally would do. Basically, every we, we, everything we do is public. And the only thing that we should implement is the class should print hello to the terminal when the object is created and bye to the terminal when the object is removed from memory. That means we don't have to create any methods apart from a constructor and a destructor. We know now that a constructor is, how is it created? Exactly, my class. We basically have no return type, and we have the same name as the class. So that is our constructor. A default constructor has no parameters, so we don't fill in anything between the braces. Now we need to implement what, what is happening at the constructor level. We're not going to put a semicolon here and see what happens. All right, so what, we do, what do we do? We basically have to create an object of my class. That means, just like we know from beforehand, we say we want to create an object of our class, my class, and we call this, for instance, class. Oh, no, that we can't do because that is a keyword. Let's call it C in this case. So now I create a, a, an object C of type my class. So what happens is, that we know already, is that this method will automatically be called as soon as we reach line 19 over here, right? So now we go over here. We basically are, we need to now create a statement that prints hello to the terminal. That we can do already blindly, I hope, right? So we know that this is uh, happening like this. IO stream is included already. I uh, use this and now we have to then print hello to the terminal. And as I uh, typically do this, we use then the end line um, character over here to then create our, uh, our constructor, right? So as soon as we now uh, uh, compile this and launch this, we will immediately have hello. Now we have the destructor. As I said, the destructor is a tilde and the same name as the, as the class. So my class again, right? And the rest is exactly the same. So we have std, c out, and what do we need to, to print by? So we print by. There we go. I'm going to try it out whether there's a, a question or not. Uh, where? Oh, thank you very much. Excellent. We might have a problem anyway, but I think. So basically, either this will work. In that case, we don't need semicolons over here and over here. Or uh, C++ will start complaining about it. Let's see. I'm not in the same directory yet. So I should go there. So let's first compile. Oh, it works. So we don't need semicolons. Answer is right there. I'll put it in the slides as well, or I remove them from the slides as well. So in this case, when we now run our program, we should say hello and bye, right? So what happened here is the hello was created at line 19. As soon as we returned from our, away from our function, our object over here, C, was destroyed, was removed from memory, and then this destructor over here was called. All right? Yes? Uh, 
Um, yeah, if you, you will see a game that is, I mean, you don't need to. Of course, I mean, I'm, this, I managed to do this, you can do this. But again, there, as soon as you start programming a class, it typically will get larger and larger and larger. And typically also there, you want to kind of move this in different files. Because at one point, your class is going to be perfect. You don't need to create new versions. Your, your class will be then the way it needs to be. In that case, it is nicer than if it's in a header and a CPP file away from where you're still messing around with codes, like typically. CPP, like CPP in your class, yeah? That's a very good point. So what we, what we know now is, what is C out? Is? Method. No, it's not a method. Object. It's an object, exactly. C out is an object. STD we don't know yet. That's a namespace that we're going to see in, well, in the new year. Um, but it, it's basically just like a collection of things that belong together. But C out is an instantiation of a class. That means somebody already created this C out object for us somewhere else, right? And we can send things to this object. This object is kind of representing our terminal. And with this operator and with other uh, methods that we've already seen, we've seen this, this buffer thing last time, right? We can basically call methods that belong to the C out object. All right? Slowly, this is starting to make sense. I have one question. What is mm -hmm. the public? What is the? the public is a class in the backend? No. So, yeah, that's a good question. So, what is this public keyword? This public keyword is actually attaching to everything that follows here, to these two, to the constructor and the destructor, but if there were methods and attributes as well, it would create and say to C++, all of those are public. If there would be a, a private there, then all of the following ones would be private. It basically, it basically shows to C++ what people can access from that class, what attributes and what methods people can call from outside. In the backend, public is a bunch of the code, yeah? Okay. Yes, but it's attached, it's kind of glued to, in this case, this, the, the attributes and the methods. In other programming languages like Java, you have to start with public or private or some others. There's also others with every, on every line, right? C++ is a little bit nicer there because typically for classes you have loads of methods. You can just say all the methods that follow now are public and then just follow and then just have all the, those methods. But it's in essence nothing else than that. Basically it just glues a label to, to all the methods that follow and say that's a public, that's a public, that's a public, that's a public. Until the, the, the private keyword comes and then everything that follows the private keyword is that is private, that is private, that is private. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, of course, typically you would have um, attributes here, like uh, private attributes, private, there we go. Uh, for instance, an int at one, for instance, and then you could also over here say that attribute one is zero, right? That is the typical use of a constructor, that you initialize things, or that you run certain code as soon as you create your objects. For now, I hope that all of you are puzzling why would you need a destructor? Why would you ever need to launch code when this uh, object is, is, is removed from memory? We'll see uh, more later, once we start to get uh, a little bit more serious with pointers and other types of constructs. All right? So what I wanted to say again is basically look <coughs> at this example. This is only slightly more difficult, not much. Um, and with what you've seen today, you should be able to do this. And then if you feel like very invigorated and say, I want to go over, over Christmas and do a bit of programming, then try this one out. All right? Good. With that in mind, oh, there's one more question. No, uh, next week we don't have anything. There's no class next week because of the, the holiday season already starting, I think, on, on Thursday. Um, there will be today... An, a server assignment, but it will be a very small one. 
and it will be on classes, so make sure that you start early on this as well. Tomorrow there will be an in-class assignment, as promised already for two weeks, right, on arrays, right, which now you should have lots of uh, practice exam. about. Sorry? Paper exam? Yes, in class. We don't call this paper exam. It's basically, you get one page, you do the, the, the quick uh, uh, assignment, and that's it. Again, it's going to be a very short one, right? So it should not take that long. You cannot open the laptop. You can't open the laptop. You have to do this by yourself. This is really for your own good, because at the final exam, you'll have to do it exactly like this. It is you and a piece of paper and a pen and nothing else. No, because we cannot uh, execute with our programming. So if in the next uh, paper exam, uh, I miss some part of my line, may look at my paper, oh, it's not possible. You can't test things out, true. Yeah. But that is an advantage. You know, if you're really mastering a, a programming language, you need to be able to just write it without testing every two lines whether this is valid or not. And of course, I'm also not perfect. I didn't know about the semicolons. It probably would not have made a difference. It probably would not have thrown an error. But typically, you should be able to do these essential things as they are. And we're not going to subtract points for very silly things either, right? It's not that we're going to type your code into a terminal and see whether it compiles. That's the advantage of the in-class assignment. We want to make sure that you understand the keywords and that you're able to do things. Uh, in this case, for tomorrow, that you're able to create an array and deal with an array. And that should not be too much to ask for. Or? OK, and good. after how many, how many sessions will we have? We will have four more sessions. Um, and they are necessary because I was ill for two, no, three weeks, I think. Right, so we need to catch up a little bit, but we're still um, in time. So, um, and, and as I said, the assignment that you will get today is a very small one, but do start with it early enough because the deadline will be then the end of next week. You should be able to do this in, in half an hour. No, actually 10 minutes, I would say. If you've paid attention today, 10 minutes, no more. Okay, good. Then thank you for coming by and for your attention, and we'll see each other tomorrow.